Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on from when and where you're joining us. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe. It's my pleasure to welcome you to CDC Public Health Grand Rounds for September 2018, Surveillance for Emerging Threats to Pregnant Women and Infants, Data for Action. We have an exciting session, so let's get started, but first a few housekeeping slides. Public Health Grand Rounds has continuing education available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, veterinarians, health educators, and others. The course code is PHGR10. Please see our website or the TCO website for more details. Grand Rounds is available on all your favorite web and social media sites. Please send the questions to grandrounds at cdc.gov. And if we can get them in time, we'll include them in our Q&A session today. Want to know more about this topic? We have a featured video segment on YouTube and our website called Beyond the Data, which is posted shortly after the session. This month's segment features my interview with Dr. Michael Frazier, Chief Executive Officer of ASTO. We have also partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles about this topic. The full listing is available at cdc.gov slash science clips. Here is a preview of upcoming Public Health Grand Round topics. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. In addition to our outstanding speakers, I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the important contribution of the individuals listed here. Thank you. And now, for a few words from CDC's director, Dr. Redfield. Thank you very much and welcome. <clears throat> uh, today's topic, surveillance and emerging threats to pregnant women and infants, data for action. As a science-based, data-driven service organization, CDC uses data in every aspect of our work. And surveillance systems are the backbone of helping us put science into action. The health risk of pregnant women, for them, Zika serves as a stark reminder about the importance of surveillance. The vulnerability of pregnant women and infants to infectious diseases. Pregnant women face some special challenges, unique physiology, changes in the immune system, various pregnancy complications. But as we all know too well these days, it's not just infectious diseases, but pregnant women <clears throat> are challenged by the opioid crisis. Today, about 100 babies are born a day in the United States with neonatal abstinence syndrome. One baby is born every 15 minutes. I recently just got back from West Virginia where I went to some of the neonatal centers that take care of neonatal abstinence syndrome, and I was sort of shocked to find out that 5% of all the pregnancies now in West Virginia give birth to a baby with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, babies are born preterm, low birth weight, and they have significant risk for poor health outcomes. <clears throat> Longitudinal surveillance data in their systems can help us better understand uh, the possible outcomes for these children and begin to uh, recognize the importance of various social determinants of health. In today's grand rounds, the surveillance of emergency threats to pregnant women and their infants, data for action, and we're going to focus on uh, some of these challenges uh, to women's health, obviously the opioids. Uh, an old friend that's back again, syphilis. Zika, an emerging new threat. So I think today you're going to get to see how surveillance data and real-time information uh, in public health uh, is able to be put in action. So I welcome the speakers today and look forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you, Dr. Redfield. And now for our first speaker, Dr. Bowen. Thank you. Good afternoon. During 2017, 918 infants were reported to CDC as cases of congenital syphilis. This represents a 44% increase over 2016 when 639 infants were reported, and a 176% increase over 2012 when a relative low of 334 cases were reported. 
Changes in congenital syphilis typically mirror changes seen in primary and secondary syphilis or incident infection among women. Cases among women are represented here by a red line. Why is the reemergence of congenital syphilis a concern? Syphilis is treatable, and every case of congenital syphilis is preventable. But syphilis is a complicated disease. Syphilis is caused by the bacteria Treponema pallidum, which is typically spread by sexual contact. Signs and symptoms of early syphilis can be difficult to detect. During the primary stage of syphilis, genital lesions, or chancres, appear at the site where the bacteria entered the body. These chancres are painless and often go unnoticed. Even without treatment, these chancres will resolve on their own within a few weeks. Syphilis then enters the secondary stage, which is characterized by rashes, wart-like growths in the genital area, and hair loss. Few patients in the secondary stage experience all of these symptoms. Without treatment, these too will quietly fade away. Untreated syphilis then enters a latent phase characterized by the absence of signs and symptoms. Patients can persist in this latent phase for years, making syphilis difficult to detect. Although less common today in the antibiotic era, syphilis can move into a late stage of disease known as tertiary syphilis. This affects the brain and heart and may lead to dementia or heart disease. Diagnosing syphilis is challenging given the many stages of disease and clinical presentations. At every stage of infection, diagnosis is made by medical history, clinical exam, and two blood tests. Screening by blood tests is the only way to detect a latent infection. An infected woman can transmit syphilis to her fetus during pregnancy. This transmission can occur at any stage of syphilis, even during the asymptomatic latent phase and at any trimester of pregnancy. Infant infection is known as congenital syphilis. Congenital infection can result in stillbirth and early infant death. Surviving infants may experience neurologic impairments, including deafness and deformities of the long bones and teeth. The infant on the right suffers from congenital rash, as well as an enlarged liver and spleen marked in ink on his abdomen. Adequately treating syphilis during pregnancy can prevent congenital syphilis. 37 states reported at least one case of congenital syphilis in 2017, but 70% of the nation's congenital syphilis morbidity resides in five states alone. These states, California, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida are shown in red. Syphilis is curable using long-acting injectable penicillin. The timely detection and treatment of syphilis in a pregnant woman is essential for preventing congenital syphilis and its complications. Because of this, CDC recommends screening all pregnant women for syphilis at the first prenatal visit, regardless of their perceived risk, and also recommends screening women again early in the third trimester if they are at high individual risk for syphilis or if they are living in an area of high syphilis morbidity. Prenatal syphilis screening is the cornerstone of congenital syphilis prevention. This was upheld several weeks ago when the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued a statement reaffirming its prior grade A recommendation for syphilis screening in all pregnant women. Understanding risk factors for syphilis among women may help clinicians determine whether a woman's individual risk is heightened and more frequent screening may be warranted, Knowing risk factors may also guide the development of interventions within a community. Known risk factors for syphilis among women include having multiple sex partners, a history of incarceration, substance use disorders, and exchanging sex for drugs, money, or housing. In addition, some women will present with no risk factors of their own, but they'll report a partner who has one of these risk factors. Once a woman is both pregnant and infected with syphilis, receiving late or no prenatal care is significantly associated with delivering an infant with congenital syphilis. There are four key opportunities to prevent congenital syphilis during pregnancy. First, a woman needs to enter the prenatal care system. Nationally, 34% of the mothers of congenital syphilis cases received late or no prenatal care and were not screened in time to prevent congenital syphilis. Within prenatal care, all women need to be screened for syphilis. An additional 8% of case mothers missed this opportunity despite being in prenatal care. 
A woman who screens positive for syphilis needs to be adequately treated with a regimen that is timely and appropriate for her stage of a disease. 18% of case mothers were either treated too late or with an inadequate regimen. Lastly, many women, including high-risk women and women living in a high morbidity area, are candidates for rescreening in the early third trimester. An additional 16% of women tested negative for syphilis at their first screening, but were later infected during pregnancy. Many of these infections were preventable by early third trimester screening. Having information on these four key opportunities is imperative for tailoring an appropriate response. Some 16% of all congenital syphilis cases cannot be classified based on incomplete information provided to CDC, which presents a challenge for identifying missed opportunities in these cases. CDC has been working to turn around the congenital syphilis trend for some time. In April 2017, CDC published a syphilis call to action, which outlines activities needed to control adult syphilis and prevent congenital syphilis. This prevention will require coordination among healthcare providers, public health departments, and pregnant women, among others. Several concrete actions that were called for in the document include improving the way health departments collect pregnancy status among women with syphilis and overall improvements in the risk factor information that's rep reported to CDC. The report also identified key surveillance gaps and opportunities for collaboration. Following the call to action, CDC awarded $4 million to nine high morbidity areas to pilot some of the prevention activities outlined. The goals of the supplemental funding include making sustainable improvements to congenital syphilis-related activities, strengthening prevention through prospective information gathering, and continuing to strengthen our understanding of missed opportunities by asking for a thorough retrospective review of all cases. This pilot project highlighted several gaps in our current methods of surveillance. The current system lacks timely ascertainment of pregnancy status for women with syphilis. Not only does this impact our understanding, it may impact the action taken toward pregnant women at the local level. The current system does not provide CDC or our local health department partners with negative test results, which may limit our ability to monitor rates of screening and rescreening within prenatal care. The current system does not create a linkage at the national level between female and congenital syphilis case reports. This limits the way we can describe the maternal risk factors among cases of congenital syphilis. Additionally, CDC does not receive information about syphilis-exposed infants unless the infant is classified as a case of congenital syphilis. Not receiving information on the healthy babies who were syphilis exposed hinders our ability to compare congenital syphilis cases to non-cases and identify compelling risk factors during pregnancy. Lastly, the current system lacks significant detail on fetal syphilis and long-term outcomes for syphilis exposed infants. Longitudinal surveillance centered around pregnant women with syphilis may provide a helpful step toward closing the gaps in surveillance that I outlined. As a result, CDC is now beginning to work in this area. Longitudinal surveillance that enrolls pregnant women at the time of their syphilis diagnosis may ensure more complete congenital syphilis case ascertainment, may allow us to examine additional maternal and fetal risk factors during pregnancy, and may allow us to follow infants postpartum and document early outcomes. The timely entry of pregnant women into longitudinal surveillance may also allow for more real-time health department intervention. Perhaps, most importantly, longitudinal surveillance during pregnancy and immediately following may be integrated across diseases, including with those that you will hear about today, like Zika and neonatal abstinence syndrome. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Masa Yazdi, director of the Massachusetts Center for Birth Defects Research and Prevention, who will speak about using birth defect surveillance to monitor Zika during pregnancy. Thanks, Dr. Bowen, and thank you for the opportunity to share our experience in Massachusetts. Zika is a mosquito-borne flavivirus that's related to dengue, yellow fever, and West Nile. 80% of people who contract Zika have no symptoms, but infection does induce lifelong immunity. 
Zika spread to the Americas and the Caribbean in 2014 and 2015, and it was the largest Zika outbreak ever recorded. We know that Zika virus infection during pregnancy can cause congenital Zika syndrome, which is a distinct pattern of birth defects among fetuses and newborns, which include microcephaly and other severe brain and birth defects. Two national efforts were established by CDC for Zika surveillance. One is the U.S. Zika Pregnancy and Infant Registry, which includes pregnant women and infant with laboratory evidence of possible Zika virus infection. This surveillance is based on exposure, and women and infant with possible infections were followed to understand potential outcomes of Zika infection in pregnancy. And in Massachusetts, this effort was led by our state lab. The other effort is the Zika birth defect surveillance, which monitors all infants with any birth defect that has been associated with Zika exposure, regardless of whether there was exposure to Zika. This surveillance is based on the outcome, and in Massachusetts, this was led by us in the birth defects program. Both of these surveillance efforts, one based on exposure and the other on outcome, are very complementary of each other. In Massachusetts, the Zika Pregnancy and Infant Registry put a priority on testing pregnant women and communicating with providers. For women and infant in the registry, information is collected on maternal health history, pregnancy exposures, neonatal outcomes, and infant outcomes through age two. In Massachusetts, all the women and infants in the pregnancy and infant registry contracted Zika through travel as we had no local transmission in Massachusetts, and there are 169 infants in the registry. As part of this effort, we in the birth defects program collaborated with the state lab by completing the maternal and neonatal assessment forms. We have highly trained abstractors who are experienced in going through medical records for infants with birth defects, so we contributed this expertise to the effort. Uh, the state lab would also notify us if there were any women who tested positive for Zika, so we would be prepared to abstract the records as soon as there was a delivery. In addition, the state lab would notify us if there was a birth defect identified when they do their infant follow-up through age two. In Massachusetts, the Zika birth defect surveillance effort is led by us in the birth defects monitoring program, and we were charged with doing rapid surveillance of those infants with birth defects that have been associated with Zika, regardless of whether there was, whether there was any exposure to Zika. Um, we also provided families with materials of maternal child health services available to them in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, we've identified 690 infants and fetuses with a birth defect that has been associated with Zika, the vast majority of which had no exposure to Zika. As part of our collaboration with the state lab, our abstractors in the birth defect program will notify the state lab if there's any mention of Zika exposure in the medical records. We also cross-check all of the infants and fetuses identified as part of the Zika birth defect surveillance against the pregnancy and infant registry at the state lab. We also check to see if any had a negative test. So this collaboration with the state lab allowed us in Massachusetts to submit data to CDC with test results, both positive and negative, uh, for Zika birth birth defect surveillance cases. Before talking about how we did rapid surveillance, I'll give you a quick overview of our birth defects monitoring program. We're an active, population-based statewide surveillance system. We first receive reports of cases from multiple sources. Once we receive these reports, we have six abstractors across the state who will review and abstract the information on cases. Cases are then reviewed by clinicians to ensure they meet our case definition. Confirmed cases are included in our registry and then are available for surveillance and research purposes. When it came time to do rapid surveillance, there were two ways that we achieved this. One was by prioritizing those birth defects that had been associated with Zika exposure, and the other was to get remote access to electronic medical records. Getting remote access decreased the amount of time needed to review the records, but also allowed for quick follow-up if we needed additional information on a case. To prioritize the Zika birth defect surveillance cases, we pushed them to the top of our abstraction list to make sure they were done first. For the remote access, we currently have access at 18 facilities. When we first started this work, we focused on our tertiary care hospitals, recognizing they'd have the largest impact. And in fact, four of our tertiary hospitals alone accounted for 35% of our abstractions. And in this figure, we see the impact of these efforts on our data. When we first started this effort, it took us over 80 days to abstract a case from when we first ascertained it. And about a year later, we've halved the amount of time it takes to abstract a case. Less than a year after establishing the Zika Pregnancy and Infant Registry, the first study came out assessing birth defects in relation to Zika infection in pregnancy. And it found that among completed pregnancies in the US with lab evidence of possible Zika infection, 6% of the fetuses or infants had Zika-associated birth defects. When looking at symptom status, a similar proportion was found among symptomatic and asymptomatic women, suggesting the severity of illness was not indicative of having an infant with a birth defect. 
And among women with infection in the first trimester, birth defects were associated with 11%. So this study raised the question of what is the baseline prevalence of these birth defects? Is what we're seeing with Zika higher than the baseline or is it what we would expect? In order to answer this question, data was collected from existing birth defect surveillance systems for the years prior to the Zika epidemic. We were one of three states that was able to provide the data and the time needed to assess the baseline prevalence. What we found was the prevalence in 2013 to 2014 was three per 1,000 live births. And when we look at the prevalence in the Zika pregnancy and infant registries, so for pregnancies with Zika exposure, we see a prevalence of 60 per 1,000 live births. So this is a 20-fold increase in Zika-related birth defects. When we consider brain abnormalities in microcephaly, we observed a 33-fold increase. This study highlights the importance of having surveillance data because without data from these birth defect surveillance systems, we wouldn't have been able to understand the magnitude of increase caused by Zika. Currently, our surveillance efforts in Massachusetts are evolving based on recent developments. Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico almost a year ago, and as a result, many families have chosen to relocate from hurricane-impacted areas. We have the fifth largest Puerto Rican population in the U.S., and it's estimated over 7,000 individuals have relocated to Massachusetts. Given the large impact of Zika in Puerto Rico, we wanted to ensure that families with infants affected by Zika were receiving the care that is needed, and they're aware of the maternal child health services available in the state. We're currently in the process of assessing what the needs and gaps are in relation to the families that we located, with the goal of connecting families to available maternal child health services, identifying families with an infant affected by Zika, and notifying the state lab of potential infants that are eligible for the Zika Pregnancy and Infant Registry. One of the challenges early on was to establish a standard case definition. This was done primarily at CDC where clinicians reviewed cases in both the pregnancy and infant registry and the Zika birth defect surveillance data to identify common patterns of birth defects. In Massachusetts, we updated our definition to ensure that we were collecting data consistent with other states. Some of the conditions monitored as part of Zika birth defect surveillance were not previously collected in our surveillance system. Therefore, we need to change our process to ensure these cases were abstracted and reviewed. We also had to work with our newborn hearing screening program to identify infants with congenital deafness, as this was also a condition we did not ascertain as part of our surveillance system. In addition, a challenge we had in Massachusetts and heard other states had as well was ensuring that information around Zika exposure was transferred from the obstetrician to the infant's pediatrician. Another challenge for us was there was loss of follow-up of the infants in the pregnancy and infant registry. And the longer-term outcomes for these infants are still not well understood. In Massachusetts, our Zika surveillance efforts were quite successful because of our collaboration with the state lab. When Zika first came on our radar, the two programs reached out to each other, and this early collaboration resulted in a more robust response to Zika. When it came time to report data, we were the first state to transfer data for the Zika pregnancy and infant registry, and among the first group to provide birth defect surveillance data. This, the collaboration led to improved data quality, and in addition to the surveillance efforts, the birth defects program and the state lab jointly organized other activities and assisted each other in connecting to other programs across the health department. In conclusion, our experience with Zika birth defects surveillance has been a success and provides a model for future responses to emerging threats. It facilitated improvements in our surveillance system and collaborations between bureaus that will be of use well beyond the Zika epidemic, and ultimately, where we were able to provide data to evaluate the potential impact of Zika infection during pregnancy. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharon Watkins, the state epidemiologist at the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Thank you for this opportunity to present on Pennsylvania. What, what I'd like to talk today is about how we as a state with no birth defect surveillance prior to 2016 used Zika birth defect surveillance resources and lessons learned to rapidly respond to an emerging threat, neonatal abstinence syndrome, described below. Based on 2015 data, there were nearly 4 million live births in the U.S., and 44 out of 50 states had some sort of birth defect surveillance program covering nearly 33.7 million live births. But over 250,000 births were not covered with a birth defects surveillance program. Pennsylvania represented 55% of the uncovered births, indicating that we were the largest state with no program at that time. There are reasons for this. There are many challenges in Pennsylvania, one being that we had no legal authority 
to collect this data. It was not on a reportable disease um, list, making it difficult for us to request this information from providers or facilities. We have uh, historically you had this information located as a checkbox on the birth certificate for a select group of birth defects. However, we know that this method is not accurate or the best way to do surveillance. Pennsylvania has statewide data for inpatient hospitalization, but it is collected and managed by another entity, and the department is only able to receive de-identified data. This is really problematic for repeat hospitalizations, for following transferred infants, and does not allow us to easily validate case codes or perform linkage. Pennsylvania had considered um, self-reporting by facilities or trying to build networks of facilities to report, but the legal challenges still remained. However, with the advent of Zika epidemic and the funding streams for the Zika pregnancy registry and the Zika birth defect surveillance process, our legal team um, reviewed this and determined that outcomes such as possible birth defects from a reportable infectious disease such as Zika could now be considered reportable. So the department began surveillance for birth defects and we used a, both a passive and an active method for case ascertainment. Passive in that we contacted the birthing facilities with a listing of the relevant ICD-10 codes, and then facilities provided back to us a facility-based case list, which we reviewed. We then sent a list with cases we would like to review and potentially abstract. So then we actively reviewed medical records for case verification, abstracted relevant data, and recorded that data in Red Cap Cloud database. As you can see, funding began on August 2016. We rapidly hired staff, and by October 2017, we had uploaded our first abstracted cases to the CDC portal. That was a great success for Pennsylvania. But three months later, after Pennsylvania had uploaded their first birth defects cases to CDC, Governor Wolf issued the very first 90-day state of emergency for a public health problem, the opioid epidemic. One of the tasks that the governor had requested was rapid collection of cases and data on neonatal abstinence syndrome. We didn't know a lot about neonatal abstinence syndrome in Pennsylvania. However, a group using Pennsylvania hospital discharge data has recently put out a report indicating that the number of NAS-related newborn stays per 1,000 newborn stays had increased by over 1,000% from 2001 to 2017 and the estimated associated hospital costs of over $14 million by 2017. So, but the actual number and the rate of NAS births was not well known, as this graphic represents hospital stays, not infants. So we had to rapidly think about how to do surveillance. And for reportable disease surveillance, we used PA NEDS, but we knew that could not be easily or rapidly amended to address NAS. We considered distributing a paper-based form, but we realized that we already had a web-based system, REDCap Cloud, and this could be streamlined. We decided to leverage the knowledge we had gained from Zika birth defects surveillance efforts. We began by producing a list of Pennsylvania birthing facilities and the corresponding annual live birth counts to prioritize outreach. We realized we knew what data fields and information we could find in the birth records and where to find it. And we already had experience with the web-based database, REDCap Cloud, in which we'd already completed extensive functional testing. So in a very short period of time, the department worked toward creating a case report form. We performed literature reviews, we, we determined what other states were doing, we created a list of facilities to reach out to, we re reviewed what data elements would be known at the time that the case report form would be filled out, which was likely to be before infant discharge, and we created defined response sets. We knew a key would be to create a one-page form, so, we, so a short form, so that we could visually shorten the form with skip patterns and drop-downs. We had to balance the desire for robust clinical data with a one-page template. You can see from this graphic that we went from a declaration on January 10th to a green light to proceed on the 24th, a survey completed on the 26th, and a live survey link and guidance distributed to 93 facilities by February 8th. 
Within two days, 18 cases were reported from six facilities. We were very excited. And as of September 13, we have 1,419 cases of NAS reported that meet the case definition. As you can see, we have continued case collection because the declaration has been extended multiple times. Within one week of beginning data collection, we had 24 facilities reporting. As of September 13, we have 80, which is 84% of the total facilities. When we include facilities that report cases that did not meet case definition, but they're still reporting, that means we have a total of 89% of our facilities reporting and engaged. So let's talk about the data. This table reflects analysis of data as of August 2nd, 2018. Mothers of infants reported to us with NES who meet the case definition are more often identified as of white race, having less prenatal care, or more often have Medicaid identified as the payer source. The infants are of lower birth weight and more often have a gestational age that is less than 37 weeks. In addition, nearly half receive care in the NICU and almost all display three or more symptoms of NAS. The following table indicates that most babies reported as exhibiting NAS are tested for laboratory evidence of opioids. Excluding missing data, 90% of infants, in fact, are tested. And of all cases who are tested, 67% were positive for opioids, 12% tested negative, 11% were pending at the time of reporting, and then the 10% not tested. So among those testing positive, 85 were positive by for some form of opioid. 67% had a, had a positive result for drugs typically related to medically assisted treatment. And 23% were positive for things like oxycodone, fentanyl, or other opioids. Of the total infants reported to us, nearly one third were recorded as having no treatment at the time of reporting. 44% were receiving morphine, and 26% of infants were being treated with a non-pharmacological therapy. So the department did not just send a link to facilities. We also developed and distributed guidance that described our authority to report, a case definition, and what criteria to exclude from reporting. We collaborated with our hospital advocacy group, and we created a long list of frequently asked questions. We also included a comment and question box within the survey, survey instrument itself to aid in data collection. We count this effort as a success. However, we acknowledge there are challenges. There is no nationally standardized case definition for public health surveillance, although CSTE is working on this. We also had no time to launch a well-launch provider education, um, and, and this immediately produced some challenges. We did see de differences in diagnosis criteria and case definitions across facilities. And as with any new surveillance effort, there really should be continuous feedback between the department and the facilities, and we simply did not have the capacity for this. However, for Pennsylvania, this has been a significant success. The department was able to leverage the infrastructure and the experience gained from one-time Zika birth defect surveillance to seed efforts in an emerging event. We were able to respond to an emergency declaration, collect large amounts of data in a short time period, and we were able to demonstrate data collection tools and methods. In other words, we realized we were data prepared. Next steps, and there are always next steps, include working with CDC through an epi aid to survey facilities and to understand the barriers, as well as to understand differing case definitions and diagnosis criteria. We hope to eventually abstract a select group of records in a few facilities to validate the data and the use of data elements. Things we are doing um, next steps are that we are working to make NAS a reportable condition through our reportable disease laws, and we are considering adding it to our newborn screening tool to facilitate ongoing reporting. We have had to have robust discussions with partners on policies and procedures and coordinated public health actions with our children, youth, and family stakeholders and others in our department. All of these steps and outcomes would not have been possible without the receipt of funding for Zika birth defect surveillance and our leveraging of these tools and lessons for critical emerging crises such as opioid. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mina Delman, Acting Branch Chief, Prevention Research and Translation Branch at the CDC.
Thank you very much, Dr. Watkins, and welcome everyone. Um, as you heard today, there are multiple threats that impact mothers and infants. And today, I will discuss how surveillance data can inform our response to emerging threats and ultimately clinical practice. As a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist, my everyday clinical decision making relies heavily on evidence-based clinical recommendations and guidelines. Guidelines published by the CDC and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists are based on different types of data. Caring for pregnant women and infants still relies very heavily on the interpretation of observational data. While randomized controlled trials are the gold standard, pregnant women are often excluded from these trials due to concerns about unknown risks to the fetus. Observational data from surveillance systems provides another source of evidence to inform clinical recommendations. When I came to CDC six years ago, I expected to have access to a national longitudinal data system that linked pregnancy outcomes, excuse me, pregnancy exposures to future outcomes. And while many different surveillance systems already exist to look at a specific disease or a specific outcome, a national comprehensive surveillance system that links pregnancy exposure data to longitudinal outcomes for infants and children has yet to be realized. Real-time surveillance for pregnant women, infants, and children is complex. First, as you see listed here, there are multiple outcomes to consider. Second, there is a time delay, up to nine months, between exposure and birth outcome, and an even longer delay when we consider an exposure during pregnancy and childhood outcomes. Third, outcomes differ by the type, level, and the timing of exposure during pregnancy. Despite these challenges, we have used surveillance data to explore associations between pregnancy exposures and maternal outcomes. For example, we have systems already in place to better understand the risk factors for maternal mortality, which has undoubtedly led to improvements in clinical care. We have defined new associations between pregnancy exposures and birth defects. CDC conducts birth defect surveillance and research and through one-time supplemental funding, expanded our Zika birth defect surveillance. And this ultimately helped to define what congenital Zika syndrome looks like. We have begun to link childhood outcomes to pregnancy exposures. And while we recognize major confounders exist, electronic systems can now link maternal and birth records with early intervention and educational data. And this model, which is in its infancy, allows us to explore if pregnancy exposures are associated with cognitive, motor, and developmental effects. Recent public health emergencies have demonstrated the importance of surveillance data to define outcomes for pregnant women and infants. During emergencies, healthcare providers request guidance on infection control, prevention, and treatment of emerging diseases. And rapid data collection has informed our response and our national guidelines. Here are some specific lessons we learned from each of the recent responses about how our data influence clinical care. The 2009 H1N1 flu pandemic highlighted the vulnerability of pregnant women to infectious diseases. In this outbreak, pregnant women experienced an increased risk of dying. 5% of all reported H1N1 deaths were among pregnant women, who represent approximately 1% of the general population. Early antiviral use was vital. Of the 56 deaths due to H1N1 among pregnant women, 55 did not receive timely antiviral medications. And this highlighted the need to communicate clearly that early antiviral use was critical, despite the limited safety data available at the time. We also face challenges with maternal vaccine acceptance. We still face these challenges, and partially due to concerns about the possible risks to the fetus. It became very clear during the outbreak that we needed to articulate the risks of H1N1 infection to the mother and the fetus, as well as the protective benefits of maternal vaccination to both. 
And lastly, providers needed to know what was happen happening during the outbreak, and CDC set up a pregnancy flu line to answer questions and disseminate information. And through this resource, CDC collected data demonstrating how severe influenza was among pregnant women and postpartum women. During Ebola, we observed high rates of pregnancy loss and maternal and neonatal deaths. However, our surveillance systems did not routinely capture pregnancy status, and no systematic collection of pregnancy or infant outcome data occurred. Thus, we do not know whether pregnant women are disproportionately affected or face a higher risk of death. We do know that obstetrical wards served as points of disease transmission. High levels of Ebola virus were present in the placenta and in the amniotic fluid. And concerns about potential Ebola transmission during childbirth had obstetricians and gynecologists around the world worried about the risk of healthcare-associated infections. This demonstrated the need for infection control recommendations specific to labor and delivery settings. But among the most recent public health emergencies, Zika undoubtedly served as the greatest and stark, most stark reminder of the need to understand the impact of emerging infectious diseases on pregnant women and infants. Not since rubella have we seen an infection cause such serious abnormalities and never from the bite of a mosquito. Zika demonstrated what our surveillance system can do. It can inform the pattern of defects associated with an infectious disease, it can provide estimates of the risks associated with congenital infection, and it can define the time frames of greatest risk during pregnancy. Despite these clear benefits and the reemergence, as you heard, of Zika, excuse me, of syphilis and opioids, we do not yet have a sustainable model for a longitudinal surveillance system to assess exposures during pregnancy and outcomes. The multi-pronged approach to use during Zika is an example that could be adapted for other exposures. And as you heard from D Dr. Yazdi, CDC collaborated with state health departments to build the U.S. Zika Pregnancy and Infant Registry. And this registry has collected information about pregnant women and infants in the U.S. states and territories. The registry now includes 7,300 pregnancies, the largest cohort being monitored, and it has unparalleled potential to answer key questions about the full impact of Zika by following the children through their later years of life. CDC also leveraged birth defect surveillance to rapidly identify fetuses and infants with Zika-related birth defects. And by capturing infants with the outcome of interest, birth defect surveillance explored exposures from a retrospective lens and established the baseline prevalence of particular defects, as well as trends over time. Now, birth defect surveillance was especially important with Zika because many Zika infections are asymptomatic, and therefore the diagnosis of maternal Zika may have been missed. I think this displays how identifying infants with birth defects um, through the Zika birth defect surveillance system complements the case finding of an exposure registry. To ensure data could be captured in real time, CDC provided surge capacity staff for health departments. These professionals provided additional public health support during the crisis. And lastly, similar to flu, CDC quickly established a hotline to answer questions and to ensure the most up-to-date information could be accessed by every healthcare provider in the country. The benefits of surveillance data were realized at the national, state, community, and individual level. Data was used to inform clinical guidance, provide targeted outreach, identify families in need, and to facilitate appropriate testing. The lessons learned can be applied to other known or emerging threats, such as the opioid crisis that we heard is affecting pregnant women and infants across the country. A similar surveillance system to Zika could help us better understand maternal outcomes associated with opioids and other substances. Infant outcomes could also be better understood through surveillance. You heard from Dr. Watkins that infants are being born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And because a standard case definition does not yet exist, it is difficult to track this condition nationwide. CDC is working with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists to define the public health case definition. And once established, we can use surveillance systems to track NAS nationally. In fact, several states have already begun surveillance based on state-specific case definitions. 
Other infant outcomes associated with opioid use, like low birth weight, infant deaths, are also important to track, and we need to understand if polysubstance use poses a risk of birth defects. Pregnancy exposures to opioids and other substances may have long-term challenges for children. Emerging data suggests some infants may have special educational and developmental needs. And through longitudinal surveillance data and linkages, we can explore long-term outcomes for infants with prenatal substance exposure. So CDC is interested in developing SETNET, a multi-pronged pregnancy and infant surveillance system for emerging threats. And in addition to Zika and opioids, this platform could be used to look at other exposures during pregnancy and could be leveraged for the next public health emergency. These presentations you've heard today have several common themes. There is a common need for longitudinal surveillance of the mother-infant dyad, the need for routine capturing of pregnancy status, the need for collection of real-world, timely data, and the need for standard case definitions. In addition, access to multiple data sources can facilitate rapid data collection and data linkage and can help us identify screening and intervention opportunities. And of course, all of this requires ongoing outreach and education to disseminate what we learn when we learn it. Common challenges you've heard, these occur across pregnancy exposures. Inconsistent case definitions do not allow us to compare data across different systems. It can be difficult to identify pregnant women who are exposed. For example, as we heard from Dr. Bowen, women who do not participate in routine pre prenatal care, it's difficult to assess and to treat uh, those mothers. Loss to follow-up is an issue, specifically as children age, families move, or they change providers or healthcare systems. And then long-term outcomes may not be known, so we don't know what we're looking for. To circle back to my own personal story, the past six years at CDC has shown me the value of public health data and how it can inform clinical guidance and help us provide better care for pregnant women and infants. In summary, a multi-pronged sustained approach to pregnancy and infant surveillance can identify risks associated with exposures during pregnancy, can inform prevention strategies and clinical management, and ultimately can help us link families to the care they need. I want to thank you for your attention, and now I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Fan Tate to the stage, the Chief Medical Officer from the American Academy of Pediatrics, who will moderate our Q&A. Welcome. Wow. Um, Please join me in thanking again the whole panel, please. Thank you. Thank you all for our excellent, excellent presentations and so um, such important uh, presentations. Um, Dr. Redfield said that surveillance is the backbone of the CDC. I had written broad and bread and butter of the, of the CDC. You can see I'm from the South. Um, this is uh, so important. As a pediatric neurologist and listening to what you all have presented, I uh, was thinking about loss to follow-up, what happens to the children, where we lose them and where they, um, they have these exposures uh, in, utero, in utero or otherwise. And the other thing I thought about is early intervention. So how do we make sure that they get uh, the help that they um, need? And then how do we circle back, as, as uh, has been said, to primary care providers to make a difference in the outcome? So this is wonderful, um, and we thank you. Now we have a few minutes, and it's my privilege to facilitate the questions that we have for our panelists. Now, we will be having questions from online, as well as you all here in the audience. I would ask, please, that you keep your questions, uh, that you make your questions concise, because we want to have a lot of them. So if you have questions, please uh, either use your microphones if you're down here in the front, or make your way to the microphone. And we're also uh, watching for questions from online, too. There's one online. We'll start with that one. 
Yes, first I'd like to say that this entire session, uh, recorded version, as well as the Beyond the Data interview and the slides themselves will be posted to our website at cdc.gov slash grand hyphen rounds. Any questions can be sent to grandrounds at cdc.gov and we will post uh, questions related to this session here. Uh, one general question we have from Kristen is, why is the mortality rate in the U.S. so much higher than in other countries, even third world countries? And I realize that's not specific to this session, but it's something that we could possibly address. So um, why don't I, I punt that one to you, Dr. Uh, Dana, please. So there are different parts of CDC that, that work on um, different parts of surveillance. So this is definitely not in my wheelhouse. Um, I think there are a lot of um, reasons why we see a higher rates of um, maternal mortality. Um, specific things that we are concerned about, um, and again, this is not my area of expertise, are things like high blood pressure during pregnancy, bleeding issues. And then we know that there's an aging maternal population, and many of those women have um, additional chronic conditions um, as we see see more older women giving birth. So I think there's a lot of causes for it. What's exciting is that there are state-based maternal mortality systems that are looking within their state at what are the causes of maternal mortality and looking at ways to adjust that. Again, this is work uh, being led out of the Division of Reproductive Health at CDC, and it's really been exciting to see over the years how we can really establish locally what the challenges are and why women are dying in particular states. Thank you, Dr. Meany Delman. Um, a question in the back, and then we'll come to the front. Um, yes, what I would like to know is have HIEs or health information exchanges been used as a surveillance data source to get more of a regional picture for either NAS or Zika? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, from a state perspective, would um, Dr. Watkins, would you like to address sure. that? Um, that's something we certainly have been thinking about, but um, many states, and I think Pennsylvania is not alone, are not that far along in our ability to accept and, and really be able to consume and use um, health exchange information. So although that's down the road, that isn't quite what we have available to us right now. Thank you. Thank you. Here in front. Denise Jamison, representing American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, I think we're fully supportive of surveillance for emerging threats to pregnant women, um, and it's really important to ensure ongoing, sustainable, and well-supported surveillance systems for emerging threats. But I want to just to point out that the threat is not opioid use. Uh, the threat is opioid use in pregnancy, not medically-assisted therapy, um, which is a recommended therapy. And similarly, um, neonatal abstinence syndrome is an expected and treatable outcome of prenatal opioid use. So I think we have to be really careful about our communication messages. Flu and Zika are threats to women. Um, so in this setting, how do we avoid stigmatizing medically assisted therapy and women who are using opioids in pregnancy? And secondly, how do we maintain the fo focus on the overall threats of opioids to maternal and child's health? Thank you. Um, we'll go back to NAS in the state, but I'll ask for others to chime in too, please. You make an excellent point, and um, I think in Pennsylvania we have used this opportunity to not just be collecting the data, but to engage in conversations with our partners. And I, that's where it's really important because um, NAS includes symptomatic infants, but we're really worried about all infants who may be exposed, mm -hmm. and then where we can do interventions uh, down the road in that family, in the life of that infant. So we're starting with data collection, but I think it's the conversation with partners and keeping in mind that stigmatization and making sure that we do our best to avoid that, including in our, the way we do surveillance and how we use it. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Um, Dr. Mainly Dalman. 
So Denise, thank you, I completely agree. And I think the most important thing we need to do is make sure that people understand that substance use disorder is a disorder, it's a medical condition. And I think there's still a lot of stigma associated with, um, with individuals who experience substance use disorder. Um, I, I agree, I think um, that I've used medication assisted therapy in my practice for years and I think we've seen the benefits of medication assisted therapy. I think it still is unclear which one is the best one to use, and I think there's a lot more emphasis and data that's needed to really inform which one is the best one for moms and for babies. Thank you. Question in the back. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, my name is Margaret Lampy. I work in our division of HIV AIDS prevention at CDC, and. Um, well, you know, we've nearly eliminated perinatal HIV transmission in the United States, and that's a really exciting accomplishment. But um, as some of you may know, recently a potential signal of um, neural tube defects was observed in Botswana with periconceptional diotegravir use. And so we are now here domestically and around the globe trying to understand if the signal is real, is there a drug class effect, and really, without, if, and if indeed this is real, we likely would not have observed this here in the United States. So, you know, this is very apropos to what we are trying to understand now with diotegravir use in the short-term um, outcomes, you know, short-term outcomes of birth defects. But, you know, there are, other, there are other key questions, such, you know, Dana has not you know, thinking through sort of long-term outcomes. We, we rack our minds around what are potential um, other adverse long-term outcomes for infants ex exposed um, you know, periconceptionally and during pregnancy. The French have identified mitochondrial toxicity as a potential problem, and we're, we're really not quite sure how to, how to have an understanding of that. So um, I'm really excited by this start of a conversation, and uh, I can assure you there are many potential questions we could look into. Thank you. I think it speaks to the need um, here and globally and otherwise. I was just thinking in terms of, of the syphilis piece. And Dr. Bowen, I wondered you want to comment on it. If, if we had not been following that, if you were not following that, where would we be and how would we be treating? So um, maybe just the importance of the ongoing piece of what we're talking about. Sure. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, it speaks to, currently we rely heavily in the congenital syphilis surveillance era. We rely heavily on case reporting. And I think what we're trying to envision here is actually a system that would move us into the 21st century where we are more certain that we have actually ascertained all of the cases of congenital syphilis that are out there. Um, that does remain a concern for us. And especially as our numbers go up, we, we kind of expect as we do better case ascertainment, they will go up before they come down. So I think it's worth pointing out that the, the numbers are increasing now and may even continue to increase next year, and that's necessar not necessarily inherently a bad thing. It could mean that we're doing a better job with case ascertainment, and I think a longitudinal surveillance system could perhaps be a step in the right direction to continue that progress. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one more online. Uh, from our Grand Rounds email box. Pregnancy outcomes vary greatly by race, ethnicity, and country of birth of mothers. How are race, ethnicity, and country of birth disparities being monitored in the surveillance systems discussed today? <clears throat> Doctor, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at who I should call on for that. It's an excellent question. Uh, Dr. Mimi Delman, do you want to address that? So I can say that the surveillance systems that we're working with do include those factors and those variables, um, and we do look at that across our various outcomes. So I think it's included in um, the national surveillance systems, and my understanding is it's also included in most state surveillance systems, but I wanted to turn it to you guys. So talking about state surveillance systems, uh, much of our reportable disease conditions are based on electronic laboratory reporting. And for those of you in states, you know that race and ethnicity and um, nativity are, are not often filled out. So for most of those kind of conditions, including things like childhood lead, where we really do want to 
have more understanding about disparities, for example, uh, those, those factors are not filled out and they require um, either calling and much resource on the part of the state to get that information or perhaps the next generation where we're looking at electronic health records to, to um, be able to get that information in. But I will point out in, in much, most of the surveillance where we're using administrative data sets or able to link across systems, we would be able to gather that information. But for other things, um, it's something we have to l rely on laboratory records and then if it's not there, get it. And, can, and Dr. Yazdi did, yeah. I wanted to. You can see in Massachusetts in our birth defect surveillance system, we do have race, ethnicity, and country of origin as it comes from the birth certificate. So if it is there, we have it and we do do routine monitoring by race ethnicity. We've also participated in multi-state studies where we pool data across states, which gives us um, a wider variety of race ethnic ethnicity to look at um, and to look at trends of birth defects over time by these factors. Thank you. And I think I'm getting the hook, yeah. so. Before you exit. <laughs> thank you, yes, for the speakers. And thank you for moderating. Yes, thank you. And yes, that is all we have time for. And please join us next month for Public Health Gun Rounds.